Okay, so, you know, we've got something pretty wild uh, that a listener sent in. Oh, yeah. They mentioned this uh, V2K device, mm-hmm. you know, voice to skull psychotronic microwave device. Right. Even included an image. And looking at this image, we see these diagrams of the LRAD and the ADS. Interesting. So let's unpack this, right? Like, what are we even talking about? Yeah. Our mission today is to dive into what these technologies actually are and uh, whether these claims about V2K being used on crowds hold any water. Right. (laughs) We really want to get to those, you know, like crucial insights without, you know, overwhelming you with a ton of detail. Right. Just the most important stuff. Yeah, absolutely. So I think what's so interesting right from the get-go yeah. is uh, what you're pointing out. You know, yeah. Our listener mentioned V2K. Alongside this image, mm. clearly depicting the LRAD, you know, long-range acoustic device, and the ADS, the active denial system. Right. These are not the same thing. Not the same thing at all. So right at the core of this deep dive, mm. we need to untangle what each of these things are. Right. And what the evidence or lack thereof suggests about their use. Exactly. Yeah. So let's just jump right into what we see right here in this image. You know, we've got the long range acoustic device, the LRD. Yep. Um, what is the fundamental idea behind this technology? Well, the LRAD, as the graphic illustrates, essentially uses focused sound waves. Okay. Think of it less like a traditional loudspeaker that blasts sound in all directions and more like a sonic spotlight. Okay. It employs an array of speakers that are designed to concentrate the sound into a highly directional beam. And this beam can get intense, right? Yeah. I mean, I'm looking at some pretty staggering numbers here. At 20 meters, it reaches the human pain threshold at 120 decibels. Yeah. That's like standing 50 meters from a jet taking off. It's loud. I mean, that's crazy. Yeah, that's a good comparison. Really puts it in perspective. The graphic provides some good context, you know, putting that 120 dB level at 20 meters on par with a jet engine nearby. Yeah. And it also notes that at 50 meters, you're still at that same intense level. Right. As you move further out, the intensity does decrease. But even at 200 meters, it's comparable to standing in the front row of a rock concert at 107 dB. Still pretty loud. And at 500 meters, it's still around the level of a subway car or a dog barking. Oh, wow. So it's quite a range. Yeah, so definitely not your you know, average PA system yeah. here. Yeah, no, no. The image really emphasizes the difference between a regular speaker spreading sand everywhere versus this tight beam of the LRE. Right, it's very focused. So we understand how the LRE works to focus sound, yeah. but the next question is why would you use it? Right. What is the intended purpose? Right. And the graphic does mention its source as general dynamics. Right. Which immediately yeah. kind of flags its connection to military and defense applications. It does, yeah. The primary purpose of the LRE is non-lethal crowd control. Okay. The idea is to use these highly focused, intense sound waves to create a painful auditory experience compelling people to move away from a certain area. All right. It's designed to be a deterrent without causing permanent physical harm. So pain without necessarily causing lasting injury. That's the goal, yeah. Okay. However, its effectiveness can be hampered by environmental factors like wind or distance. Right. And its use raises some concerns about the potential for misuse and unintended auditory damage. Okay, interesting. So there are some caveats there. Yes, definitely. Okay, so we've talked about the LR rod. Uh Uh-huh. The other significant piece of technology in this image is the active denial system, or ADS. Right. This sounds like straight out of science fiction. Yeah, a little bit. What is the core principle at play here? This is where things get really interesting. Okay. The ADS operates using a completely different principle altogether. Okay. Instead of sound waves, it uses millimeter wave electromagnetic energy. Interesting. And the graphic describes it as deterring attackers with pain without injury Uh by causing a burning sensation. Yeah, a burning sensation from electromagnetic energy. So how does that actually work? Well, the graphic explains that these millimeter waves penetrate the skin to a very shallow depth. Okay. About 164th of an inch. Uh And when these waves hit the skin, they cause the water molecules there to vibrate, rapidly generating heat. Okay. A two-second burst, according to this information, can heat the skin up to 130 degrees Fahrenheit. Wow, that sounds incredibly uncomfortable. Yeah. The graphic even has a temperature scale showing that people will reflexively pull away at 122 degrees Fahrenheit. Right. Which is significantly hotter than our normal body temperature of 98.6. Yeah. It makes you think about the ethical implications of developing these kinds of tools. Definitely, yeah. So it's designed to create this 
immediate and powerful discomfort. Yes. Right? So Encouraging people to disperse. That's the idea. And the image also includes this schematic of the ADS mm -hmm. showing an antenna mounted on a military vehicle emitting this red beam at a frequency of 95 gigahertz. Right. Now, it's important to note that this red beam is likely just a visual representation for the graphic as millimeter waves themselves are invisible. Exactly. And the source for this information is credited to Catherine Y. Spong uh -huh. of the Chicago Tribune staff, suggesting a journalistic or educational origin. Okay. So we've got the LRAD and the ADS. Yeah. Both aimed at crowd control. Right. But using vastly different methods, one focused sound, the other focused heat. Uh-huh. This brings us to what our listener originally asked about. Okay. The V2K or voice to skull psychotronic microwave device. Right. This wasn't in the image. No. So what is this all about? This is where we move into a realm with uh, significantly less scientific consensus okay. and a lot more speculation. Got it. V2K, or voice to skull, as it's often described, refers to the alleged transmission of sounds or even voices directly into a person's head. Interesting. The idea is that this could be achieved using microwave technology. Transmitting voices directly into someone's head. Yeah. It still sounds like something straight out of a sci-fi movie. I know, right? How is that even supposed to work, theoretically? Yeah. Well, the concept often draws on the microwave auditory effect, okay. which was identified by Alan H. Frey back in 1961. Mm -hmm. Frey discovered that pulsed microwave signals could, in fact, be perceived as sounds by the human auditory system. Right. Essentially, the rapid heating and cooling causes the brain tissue to expand and contract very slightly. Lately, wow. And very quickly creating a tiny pressure wave that the ear can interpret as sound. Fascinating. It's a real phenomenon. So there is a real scientific phenomenon there. Yes. But how does that leap to transmitting complex sounds or voices yeah. into someone's head? That's the question. And what about this whole psychotronic aspect? Well, the term psychotronic in this context yeah. often refers to the idea of technologies that can interact with or influence the human mind or nervous system, oh, wow. potentially affecting thoughts, emotions, or behavior from a distance. Interesting. So the psychotronic part links into that very idea of remotely interacting with the nervous system. Okay. Potentially to influence thoughts, emotions, or behavior. Got it. In the context of V2K, it suggests using this technology to implant voices or sounds directly into someone's mind. Okay, so this is where it gets very speculative. Yeah, this is where things get really murky. Because when we start looking for evidence of V2K being used, especially on crowds. Right we encounter a significant lack of scientific consensus or official documentation right. confirming its existence or use in that manner. Exactly. What we do find is that V2K is a recurring theme in conspiracy theories and claims of electronic harassment. Yes, that's where it pops up. So we're talking about people believing they're being targeted with this technology on an individual level. Exactly. There are online support networks and communities of individuals who believe they are being subjected to V2K. Oh, wow often attributing it to government programs. Okay. The CIA's M. Culture project is frequently mentioned in this context. Interesting. Or referencing Alan Frey's early research. Okay. When you search online for V2K used on crowd, the results you get are primarily personal blogs, forums, and petitions like those on change.org. Interesting. You might find anecdotal accounts, but what you won't find is credible news reports from established media outlets right. or official government documents confirming its use on crowds. That's a pretty stark contrast to the ADS. It is, yeah. Which, while not used on crowds that we know of, is at least a real developed technology with a physical basis. Exactly. So just to be crystal clear, yeah. the V2K that our listener mentioned and the LR80 and ADS in the image they sent, right. these are fundamentally different things. Yes, absolutely. The image is all about the LR8 and the ADS. Okay. Both real technologies with the ADS using millimeter waves for heating. Right. V2K, on the other hand, allegedly involves voice transmission via microwaves yeah. and remains unproven, okay. particularly in terms of crowd control applications. Okay, so let's come back to the active denial system. Okay. Since that at least uses electromagnetic energy, right. even if for a different purpose than V2K. Uh -huh. The image tells us how it works on a physical level. Yeah. But what's the story behind its actual deployment or lack thereof? Right. Well, the ADS is indeed a real technology. Right. First unveiled back in 2001, mm -hmm. it was developed with the intention of providing a non-lethal way to control crowds, secure perimeters, and deny access to areas. Okay. It was even deployed in Afghanistan in 2010. Really? But here's a key point. 
it was withdrawn without ever being used in combat situations. Withdrawn without use? Yep. Do we know why that happened? The reasons for its withdrawal without deployment aren't entirely clear. Okay. But it likely involved a combination of logistical challenges, concerns about its practical impact in complex scenarios, mm -hmm. and perhaps a lack of clearly defined tactical situations where its use was deemed both necessary and appropriate. Interesting. Fast forward to 2014, and we see the development of vehicle-mounted versions, oh. indicating ongoing interest in the technology, as well as the development of more portable versions. So they're still working on it? It seems so, yeah. And what about using it on actual crowds here at home? Like in a protest situation. Yeah. Have there been any instances of that? There have been instances where the potential use of ADS on crowds has been considered. Okay. Back in August 2010, the Los Angeles Sheriff's Department announced their intention to use the ADS for controlling incarcerated individuals. Oh, wow. At the Pitches Detention Center. Okay. However, there's no confirmed record that it was ever actually deployed in that setting. Interesting. More recently in 2020, during some of the protests near the White House, right. federal officials reportedly considered using the ADS against protesters, but ultimately it was not deployed. So despite being a real technology designed for non-lethal crowd control, uh -huh. there are no documented cases of the ADS actually being used on a crowd in a real world scenario outside of testing. Right. To our knowledge, it has never been used. That's a crucial distinction. It is, and it really underscores the difference between having a technology and actually deploying it in practice, yeah. especially when it comes to dealing with human populations. Right. There are clearly practical, logistical, and public perception factors that come into play. Okay, so let's lay this out side by side That's to make count. sure we're on the same page. Okay. V2K versus ADS. Yeah. What are the absolute key differences that our listeners should take away from this discussion? The core distinctions are these. Firstly, the technology type. Okay. V2K is alleged to use microwaves for voice transmission, while ADS is a real system using millimeter waves for skin heating. Okay. Secondly, the effect. Yeah. V2K supposedly transmits voices or sounds into the head, whereas ADS causes a burning sensation on the skin. Okay, number three. Thirdly, the scientific basis. Uh -huh. The microwave auditory effect is a real phenomenon, right. but its application to V2K for voice transmission, especially at a distance and for crowd control, is unconfirmed and highly speculative. Right. ADS, on the other hand, has a verified scientific basis in electromagnetic heating. Okay. Fourthly, crowd use. Yeah. There are no documented instances of V2K being used on a crowd. ADS has been considered for crowd use, right. but to our knowledge, never actually deployed in that way. Right. And finally, the level of association. Okay. V2K is highly associated with conspiracy theories, oh. while ADS, while debated for its potential impact, right. is at least a recognized and developed technology. Right. Right. So that really clarifies things. Hopefully. So the key takeaway here for you, our listener, is that the image you sent us detailing the LRAD and ADS right. is not about V2K. Right. While ADS is a real technology that has been considered for crowd control, it hasn't actually been used in that way in public settings. Right. And V2K, the idea of transmitting voices into people's heads using microwaves, remains unproven and is largely tied to conspiracy theories mm -hmm. with absolutely no credible evidence of being used on crowds. Yeah, it's important to separate those things out. So navigating the world of information, mm -hmm. especially when it involves complex technologies and claims that can sound alarming, yeah, yeah. can be challenging. Def we hope this deep dive has helped to shed some light on these different concepts and the current understanding around them. Yeah, I think we covered a lot of ground today. Absolutely. And on that note, here's something for you to really think about. Okay. In a world where technology is advancing so rapidly, right. and some of these advancements happen with limited public knowledge, uh -huh. how do we, as informed individuals, effectively distinguish between credible threats and applications, yeah. technologies that are still in the realm of potential but unproven, yeah. and claims that really lack any substantial basis in evidence? It's a really important question. What responsibility do we each have to critically evaluate the information we encounter, uh -huh. especially when it touches on sensitive areas like public safety and personal autonomy. Yeah, how do we navigate this new world? Maybe that's a crucial area for our next deep dive. That's a good idea. Until then, keep questioning, keep learning, and thank you for sharing your curiosity with us. Thanks for listening. See you next time.